are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the survivors and the victim of the Craigslist killer. Now, when an online meeting turns deadly, the only lead turns out to be a blurry picture until a survivor comes forward with details into who this person is and what their motive could really be. If you don't know, it is my absolute passion to talk about these stories, and I mean absolutely no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leaving a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2009 in Massachusetts and Julissa Brisman was actually a 25 year old visiting Boston. She lived in New York City in Bensonhurst in a small one bedroom with a roommate, but she was a beautiful model who was always traveling for work. And so she was barely ever actually in New York City. So at this point she was in Boston and her friends and family knew her as a very mysterious girl who was so pretty that people would pay her thousands of dollars to just go to their parties and either, you know, hand out drinks or food or just be there basically as eye candy. But her roommate, who was named Max Cooperman, claimed that she was out of town working a lot, was barely there, and he was very protective over her as well. But when Jalissa wasn't working, she adored animals. That was one of her biggest passions. She had her own dog named Coco Chanel, and she kept a photo of her dog with her on her nightstand at all times. She would also volunteer at PETA to fight for animal rights and so it was something that was very very important to her but on top of all of this she would also work some more stable jobs to make sure she had an income. She would work as a bartender and masseuse and worked in a tanning salon as well. She was a hard-working girl with a really good head on her shoulders. She had gone through a period where she was drinking quite a lot, partying was a huge part of her identity and this kind of all came from the fact that she was a bartender so she she was around all of that kind of stuff but when she saw that it was kind of getting out of control she said she woke up one day and she decided she needed to take better care of herself in her diary she had written i had a taste of the sober life and i liked it she had even gotten a tattoo of the date of her you know starting her sobriety and this was on september 19th 2008 but one of her main motivators in all of this was her little sister who looked up to her and she wanted to be a good influence for her. She also loved the fact that her mother was so supportive of her and wanted the best for her and her mom even said one Mother's Day that the best gift that Julissa could give her was her sobriety. That's all she needed from Julissa because she knew how hard it was to fight for that every day. But most importantly, Julissa was proud of herself for doing this and she had actually taken steps to write out a list of people who she had wronged or who had wronged her and she wanted to go to them individually and see if she could repair the damage that had been done over this time period where she was not in her right mind. She had plans to help everybody in her life to get on better terms with everybody and she also decided she wanted to go back to school to be a counselor and help other people who dealt with those same things as she did. Her main fears were the death, sharks, needles, and lobsters, but her worst fear of all was relapsing. And she had written in her diary, once that happens, I'll be a goner probably. And what will happen to my family? friends, acting, life. I love sobriety and I'm afraid to ever lose it. But while so much was going on in Julissa's life and she was fighting every day to keep her head above water, she was still described by her friends as a beautiful person inside and out, a girl who had lots of energy but was also always there to count on. Many of them blamed themselves for what would happen next, especially her roommate, Max. You see, on April 14th, Julissa was in Boston for work, and investigators had also been called to the Copley Marriott Hotel in Boston because there had been a crime. You see, a woman had heard screaming outside of her door and went to check and immediately called hotel security. They would run into the hallway to find a woman lying on the floor right outside of her bedroom, and she was bloodied. 
Immediately, the hotel security called for an ambulance and said that this was an emergency. It was a little after 10 p.m. when this had occurred and this woman would be transferred to Boston Medical Center. However, even though she was partially alive when they did leave the hotel, by the time they got to Boston Medical Center, she had passed away. Investigators immediately knew that this was a murder and this was committed in a personal and violent way. This woman had been brutally attacked. She had her skull fractured and basically bludgeoned by what appeared to be the butt end of a gun. She also had been shot three times, once in the heart, once in the chest, and once in the abdomen, all at very close range. She had bruises on her wrist as well well as what appeared to be a piece of a plastic zip tie on one of her wrists as though she had been bound. She was a small woman around 5'5", five five, weighing around 105 pounds, but it appeared as though she had fought back. She had skin underneath her fingertips, she had bruises everywhere, and she hadn't gone down without a fight. The mirrors in the hotel room were actually shattered all the way around. There was glass everywhere, and this woman was identified as Julissa Brisman from her college ID inside the room. We're interviewing a security supervisor, uh, Alan McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy, could you please introduce yourself by saying your first and last name and by spelling both? Alan, A-L-A-N, McCarthy, M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y. Okay, is it true that your date of birth is 12-30-61? Yes. All right, you were working this evening, sir? Yes. And what is your function at the hospital? I mean, I'm sorry, at the hotel. I'm the security supervisor for the 3 to 11 shift. Okay, sir. Uh, could you go over, is it true that we've spoken for approximately 10-15 minutes about the events that occurred tonight? Yes. Okay, and I'd like to just go over those again uh, on the uh, recorder. Could you please start at the beginning, what first drew your attention to this incident tonight? Um, I was in one of the hotel elevators coming down from another call when I got a call from the, hotel, uh, the security dispatcher stating that he received multiple calls from the hotel operator that there was a woman uh, possibly unconscious laying down in the hallway by her room. Um, and what did you do next? Um, I proceeded up to the room. I got off the elevator. As I turned the corner, um, heading towards the room, I noticed a female uh, halfway coming out of her room laying on the floor uh, with her hair, head was faced away from me uh, towards the other end of the hallway. Okay, was she on her back or her stomach? She was on her stomach. Um, what, what was your first actions when you observed her on the floor? Um, I went over to the side of her and knelt down to see if, if she would respond to me saying, Miss, are you okay? Are you okay? Um, you, she, you're moving hands as you're saying that. Were you shaking her slightly? I sh shook her slightly, yes. Okay. Um, I didn't get any response. Uh, her hair was covering her face. As I moved her hair away, I noticed her face was covered in blood. Um, and I al also noticed on her right wrist she had a like a plastic garbage bag tie. Um, and I also noticed in the room when I looked in that uh, the, the sliding glass doors inside the room uh, was shattered, there was glass on the floor, and I noticed some seepage of blood coming from the, uh, her back shirt. I felt for a pulse on her neck and her wrist uh, and, and felt nothing. Uh, actually, prior to that, I, I called my dispatcher to notify EMS and BPD that we had a serious situation, and then I you know, felt for a pulse and noticed all the glass and everything in the room. Before this news was ever even released, before anybody besides the people at this hotel and investigators knew what was happening, one of Julissa's friends actually called the Boston police out of seemingly nowhere. No one had contacted any one of her family or friends, but this was a woman named Mary Simmons, and she was also Julissa's boss at the tanning salon. She began to tell investigators that her friend Julissa had not been answering her phone. She also knew that Julissa was staying at this hotel and she tried to call the hotel to see what was going on after she had texted Julissa several times and had heard nothing, but by this time, investigators had already found her body, so when Mary called, they actually transferred Mary 
to the Boston police to talk to them. While investigators were searching for further forensic evidence, they explained to Mary what had happened, but Mary could actually help them more than they could help her in this scenario because she began to tell them that Julissa had actually been at this hotel room for an appointment, that she would often go to different cities and she would stay in hotels and advertise for massages. You see, Julia worked as a masseuse, like I told you, and these were posted on Craigslist, where she would find her clients. She would change the location on Craigslist and get new clients to her hotel room, and Mary helped do all of this for her since she was so busy, and it was also a way for Julissa to stay safe if there was somebody else who was in contact with them and who knew what she was doing at all times. This also meant that Mary could tell them exactly who Julissa was with that night. Mary said that her last client was a man named Andy. She quickly offered up his email, his address that he had given, and she also gave them the password to this Craigslist account or to the email address account to see the conversation between the two of them. A man named Mark Rash was then brought in to help investigators and he was someone who had once led the computer crime unit for the U.S. Department of Justice. So he was very good at technology and he began diving into these emails finding the conversation between Julissa and Andy. He found that Julissa was visiting Boston for three days and she had a room on the 20th floor. He also found that Julissa and Mary were going by the name Morgan when it came to these listings just to be safe and they only ever talked to Andy over email or text until a few minutes before she met him. Andy had emailed them and said, I myself am visiting Boston and was looking for a 10 p.m. or later appointment tonight or tomorrow. Unfortunately, I will not be free any earlier. When he didn't get a response, he emailed again saying, Morgan, I can still make it tonight, but I'm thinking tomorrow at 10 would be better for me, but otherwise I'll be there tonight as planned. Thanks, Andy. Morgan, or Julissa, or Mary, answered that her appointment basically had moved to later that day, so she could actually do that night or the next night around 10, 30, 11 like he had wanted, and he responded that the next night around 10 would actually be better for him, and the next night was April 14th. That night, Mary answered a phone call around 9.41, about 19 minutes before his appointment, and he was saying that he was at the hotel early. Mary told him that he needed to wait until 10, and then he could go ahead and go up to the room on the 20th floor. She texted Julissa, telling her exactly what was happening, that he was already there, but it would only be a few minutes into this appointment that Julissa would be murdered. When Mary didn't hear from her, she knew something was very wrong. They had a system where right before and right after they would call each other to make sure everything had gone okay. And that is not what happened this night. Mary had sent her a text around 11 p.m., then 12, then 5.30 a.m., then 7.30 a.m., and the sun was up, no text was coming in, and that's when she finally called the hotel and then was put in contact with the Boston police. Mark from the computer crime unit began looking into the phone that was used to call Mary that night, hoping that this could identify who the caller was. He hoped to track this number to an actual address or to a name, however, he soon realized this was from a disposable phone and was completely untraceable. Mark wasn't done searching though. He began looking even further online to dig up clues while investigators were looking for physical evidence to find a killer. Meanwhile, Julissa's roommate Max was mourning the loss of his friend while her other friends and family members were as well, but Max said that he always tried to warn her about seeing guys all the time and to watch out for perverts, and he said that he felt really guilty that he didn't try to inform her even more about these kind of men. Investigators then decided to go to the hotel and ask for surveillance footage from that day. They found a busy hotel lobby with dozens of people going in and out. They weren't sure exactly who they were looking for, and it wasn't until they found more victims that they were able to connect them all. You see, there had been a call made four days before Julissa's murder, and this was from a 29-year-old woman named Trisha Leffler. She had called to report a crime, and this was against her. She had been at the Weston Copley Place Hotel, a different hotel than the one that 
they were looking into a murder at, but this was nearby. She was there to give a massage because she also posted for clients on Craigslist. Trisha claimed that that night, it was April 10th, and she let this man in the door, but she was bound, gagged, and robbed at gunpoint instead. Thankfully, Trisha did survive to tell this tale. She was able to inform investigators of the man who had done this to her, or at least what he looked like. She said that he was tall, he was blonde, he was clean cut, and that he also kind of seemed like he knew what he was doing. She said he, she believed he was young around in his 20s and that as soon as she closed and locked the door, she saw a gun pointed at her and he began to tell her to lie on the floor on her stomach and he proceeded to put plastic ties around her wrist. That is when he began to rummage through her suitcase. He found $800, took that, put it in his pocket, as well as credit cards. She watched as this man put on gloves and grabbed her cell phone and started just pressing buttons, but she determined after that he actually had deleted his number and all trace of him from her cell phone. Yet he didn't cover his face from her at all. And so, of course, that leads you to believe that you're not going to survive to be able to say what this man looks like. But after this, he began to gag her with duct tape, but not to the point of suffocation. It's unknown whether he was trying to kill her or just to subdue her or knock her out, but he did cut the phone room lines after this. He grabbed a pair of her underwear, put it in his pocket, took her to the bathroom in the hotel room, tied her up to the doorknob, and then put duct tape over her mouth. She was able to get out of these ties. She ran outside to ask a neighbor for help and investigators finally came. But after this happened to Jalissa and they began looking into that case as well, they realized this could be the same man, but he had escalated to murder already. They began looking at the surveillance footage for a tall blonde man at both crime scenes and it wasn't long before they found him. Trisha saw the surveillance footage from her hotel and she confirmed that this was the man in her room. And at Julissa's hotel, what appeared to be the same man came walking through four days later. And the timing of when this man checked his phone and started a call was around the same time that Mary received a call from him. Now, upon leaving both hotels, he was extremely collected and calm, like he didn't rattle easily. Trisha looked at the surveillance photos of this man at Julissa's hotel and believed that it was actually from the same night as her robbery because he looked identical. And then she was informed that this was actually from another hotel and she was confused and then horrified when they told her that this man had done it again and had killed a woman. Yet with no identifying factors, they asked the public for help sending out these surveillance photos all around and investigators also made a statement saying that they believed this could have been a robbery gone wrong as he didn't kill the first victim, but they said, it appears that the victim engaged in a struggle in the threshold of the hotel room immediately prior to the shooting. Unfortunately, two days later, it would happen again. This time it was in Warwick, Rhode Island, and this was around 40 miles from the other hotels. This was a woman named Cynthia Melton, and she was at the Holiday Inn Express. She had gotten an appointment from Craigslist where she posted that she would do dances for men and she actually worked at a Cadillac lounge which was a stripping lounge and she was an exotic dancer however on the side she would post on Craigslist to make a little bit more money. Her client that day wanted to meet at 11 p.m. and Cynthia was one who was used to creepy men being uncomfortable and taking all precautions to stay safe. However, you can't evade all evil and unfortunately that's what she was met with this day. The one thing different about Cynthia though was that she actually had a husband who was in town. His name was Keith and he had begun to call her when she wasn't picking up after what would have been her appointment time and when she wasn't answering a little after 11 p.m. there was a knock on the door. Keith had gone to check on his wife who he knew did this for money and he wasn't met with his wife when the door opened. He was face to face with a gun. He immediately, out of instincts, backed up and tripped over himself, falling on the floor, and this man with a gun began running out of the hotel. When he finally collected himself and ran to the hotel room, he saw his wife lying on the ground, 
bound at the wrists. However, she was alive. Cynthia gave a statement to investigators and it all sounded far too familiar. She said that a tall, young, blonde man entered her room. This time he was wearing a baseball cap when he pointed the gun at her. He told her to get down on the ground. He tied her up with plastic ties and then he placed a ball gag around her head and was trying to put it in her mouth to silence her. However, she continued to shake her head no to try to get him off of her and finally he gave up and moved on. That's when he began to rummage through all of her belongings and try to look for money or that's what she assumed. Investigators were sure that this was the same man. However, Cynthia had told them that he'd actually spoken to her, which was different than, you know, the prior survivor had said. Apparently this man had asked Cynthia why the phone kept ringing. She said she didn't know. And then she said that when he was looking through her room, he turned to her and he said, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. Just give me the money. However, if this really was the same man, he had already killed before. So did this mean that Julissa's murder was accidental? Investigators were able to trace the phone that was used to call Cynthia for the appointment. However, once again, this was a disposable phone and this phone was actually able to be traced to a previous location. This was at a nearby Walmart. So investigators headed there to look at their surveillance footage and that's when they found this man buying the very baseball cap that he would later wear at a crime scene. Even though they had footage of this, it was not leading to the name of a suspect. That would actually be in the hands of the electronic team, the electronic trail that they were looking at. And the emails used by this man were different every time and they were created a few days before an appointment was made. So the activity on that account couldn't be traced further than those emails to that specific girl. However, the IP address on the computer used to make those emails could be traced and it was traced to a Boston internet service provider. So investigators got in contact with them and they found the exact IP address. Now, this was when investigators got a name and an address and this was at Eight High Point Circle in Quincy, Massachusetts. It was for a man and investigators were ready to arrest him. However, they had to remember that this didn't 100% mean this was the guy, this was the killer, especially because his IP address was actually from a wireless router and he lived in an apartment. So basically anyone in the building could be using it. Before heading to the apartment, investigators did search this man's name on Google and on Facebook, and the man did match the description. This was a man named Philip Markoff, and sure enough, he was young, tall, and blonde. So they decided to follow him for the next few days to see if they could get any evidence to see if he would make any more appointments. That is when they actually sent a photo of him in a photo lineup to the first victim, Trisha, to see if she would identify him, and she sure did. Four days after the attack on Cynthia, Philip Markoff exited his home and he had what appeared to be a suitcase with him. Investigators began to get worried that he was going to skip town, leave their jurisdiction, and they wouldn't be able to do anything about it, so they actually followed him onto Interstate 95 in Walpole, Massachusetts, and pulled him over. He actually had someone in the car with him as well as $1,600. Philip was talking to investigators and asked if he was speeding, but they just kind of ignored him and asked where he was going that night. Philip said he was just going to the casino for a little trip, but instead he was going to be staying in police custody that night. And he actually didn't want to talk when he was brought to police headquarters. Meanwhile, investigators headed to his apartment to search for a murder weapon, and they found a Springfield Armory X69 semi automatic and a hollowed out medical textbook. They also found bullets as well as plastic zip ties and duct tape. Disposable phones were found there as well. Yet, Philip Markov was a 23 year old man, and the last person on earth that anybody who knew him expected to be a killer. He was born in New York to Susan and Richard, who were divorced when he was very young, but he had a brother named Jonathan and a half-sister as well, and he also at one point had a stepfather. Now, his family wasn't really known in the community. They were quiet and they kept to themselves, but Philip did incredible in school from the very beginning. He was a member of the National Honor Society and he was in multiple extracurricular groups. He was very involved and he wasn't popular, but he did have friends. Those who knew him said that he was even-tempered except for when he would lose 
it something like golf and Philip's mother actually worked at a casino for a few years when he was younger so he would actually go with her and that's where he learned about poker. He went on to college where he would study pre-med at sunny Albany where he would graduate in only three years. He was in a fraternity and some said that he was so closed off that he would just get on his computer for eight hours a day and not talk to anybody. But others said that he was kind of like a playboy. Like he would go up to girls and ask them for help. So they would tutor him, but then he would ace every exam even without their help. He also volunteered at a hospital where he would end up meeting a 25 year old named Megan McAllister, who would become his girlfriend. That's when he went on to Boston University School of Medicine and was two years in during this time. Now he he had also proposed to Megan at a beach and they were planning this luxurious wedding. But his lab partner at medical school said, you never knew what Phil you were going to get. He wouldn't look at you when he talked to you. He often seemed tired and depressed. He came in once at 5 a.m. looking like death warmed over. It was the morning of a big exam. He said he had just driven in from New Jersey because he had a fight with his girlfriend and had to deal with it. He could barely bring himself to speak. Yet at the same time, there were trophies from the women he had attacked of their underwear stuffed in socks under his bed. The same bed he shared with his fiance. Now, while being questioned, Philip seemed to not know why he was there. He was asked if he wanted a lawyer and he said it depended on what this was about. He said he didn't know where to get a lawyer, he couldn't afford one, and so he ended up saying that he would answer the questions for a while. Now, when investigators were asking him kind of the same questions over and over to try to get more information out of him because he was very vague about his answers, he began getting very angry. They would ask him if he had been to any hotels recently. He continued to say he didn't think so, that maybe he had to walk through a hotel lobby to get somewhere else, but he didn't know. He couldn't remember anything. And so when they would try to pull out more information out of him, he would just continue to say he didn't recall much and then he got so upset that he said he just wanted a lawyer. So no specific memory, no hassles with any girls whatsoever. Not in the Western Hotel, the Marriott Hotel, no problems. No problems. What does that mean? I already answered this. Okay, and again, I just, because We're the tape doesn't pick it up, that's why I asked it once again. Have you been in Rhode Island at all lately? Well, I go through Rhode Island. Okay, do you stop? Have you stopped going through Rhode Island at a hotel at all? Maybe to get gas. At a hotel? At a hotel? Yeah. You can get gas at a hotel. Well, that's what I asked. Have you stopped? I don't think so. On the way through? You don't think so? You don't think you're at a hotel in Rhode Island? I don't think so. Okay. You seem to be getting a little frustrated. Yeah, because you keep getting asked for me the same question. Well, I moved on from the Western, and I moved on from the Marriott, and now I'm in the state of Rhode Island. You say that you go to Foxwoods all the time. I'm just asking if maybe you stopped into a hotel in Rhode Island. Maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think I'm going with all this? I don't know. What are your thoughts? Talk to me for a minute. Instead of answering all the questions, tell me what your thoughts are. Tell me what you feel right now. Because you seem to be getting a little frustrated with me. And I can understand. I can understand where you're coming from. That's when investigators also brought in his fiance to talk to her to see if she knew anything about this man and the fact that he could be a possible killer. Her name was Megan and she seemed pretty open to the questioning. She was answering anything that they had for her and when she was showed a photo of the hotel surveillance where there was the man who was, you know, thought to be the attacker, she did say it looked like Philip. In one photo, she said that he was too big to be Philip. She did say she saw the resemblance, but she also said he never wore those kind of shoes. She was asked where she was at the time of the murders, and she said that for about a month, she had been out of town visiting her parents in New Jersey, and she kept in contact with him the whole time, and she said that every time she called on their home phone, he was always there to answer it. But throughout the questioning, quite a lot came up about money. Megan said that they were struggling, going basically dollar by dollar, that she couldn't get a job because of her back pain. She was starting medical school in the Caribbean in the fall, and so they were in a really sticky situation. She was looking for jobs online, but she was never contacted about it. And she said that Philip was in school full time, so he was actually taking out loans to pay for their apartment and any other bills 
bills they had to pay. Investigators throughout this time seemed to be hinting that he could have possibly done this crime because he was desperate for money and due to the fact that he was also taking the victim's money. And Megan had also said she had already gotten her wedding dress, was planning this extravagant wedding. And the wedding dress she had gotten was actually a Vera Wang, which is quite a nice, not inexpensive dress. She appeared to have quite extravagant taste. And on her registry, she had also put a luggage set that was worth $1,600. At the same time, it was believed that Philip may have had a gambling problem because they would often talk about staying in a local hotel, which was also a casino, and Philip had signed up for points that were used by frequent gamblers. But Megan said that he always stopped before he ran out of money and only would leave when he had over the amount of money that he had come in with. Some believe that he felt desperate with his financial situation, and that was his motive. This one day, we were getting cell phone calls every five minutes, like from Massachusetts cell phone. Like, very, very sketchy all day. And, and we also, all the time, get random calls from people, and we just went into at our, on our landline, and it's just an awful phone, and, you know, we get lots of, you know, it's... What kind of sketchy calls? This one, uh, this one person keeps calling. He sounds not right, like mentally not right. And he, you know, like he's like jibber jabber kind of talking. And it's happened a few times. Then there was one day, um, and every five minutes we would get a different cell phone. It, it would be, say, you know, Massachusetts cell phone number. And it would be like every five minutes and it'd be a different Massachusetts cell phone number and they'd be calling every, and, and we, you know, just stop picking up. And then we, like, finally I just said, stop calling and, you know. Were they asking for anything, saying anything? What, what would be the they, they, they were like asking for somebody, some random person. I, I don't even remember, you might remember the person's name that they were asking for. We get, I mean, we get like calls all the time asking for so-and-so. Is there any reason for me to be, like, scared to go home with this person? <laughs> Might be outside? Um, at, at this time, we're going to make some decisions. We're going to we're gonna actually, we don't know what's going on outside this room, so we're going to... Like, I, I just... Uh, do you have any reason to fear him? No, not at all, but I'm just... Are you... You're worrying me. Well, I can see. This is a very <laughs> serious business, and, you know, we don't mean to worry you. We don't yeah. mean to alarm you in any way. It's okay, I'm, I, no, I'm just wondering if, if he's one of... Two or one of, you know, 30. After questioning, Megan was released. She ended up going back to her parents' home in New Jersey, and Philip's family came to see him while in jail. They were actually told by him to leave the state because even more information would be coming out, and it was believed that this would make them uncomfortable or make them, you know, upset at him, so he told them to leave the state. Now, this man was being dubbed the killer geek, the clean cut killer, and the Craigslist killer. And the photos of Philip graduating college, having a, you know, doctor's lab coat on were plastered everywhere because nobody could believe that this smart, successful man could be a killer. Yet, from his posts and replies for the ads on Craigslist, it appeared he had a much darker side. He also appeared to believe that he was smarter than everybody around him, which could have been why he didn't cover his face from the victims or from the surveillance footage. He didn't believe he could be caught. But his family claimed that they had arrested the wrong man. Yet a school friend of his said that one night when they were drinking, Philip had kind of pushed her against a wall and tried to kiss her. When she was saying no, trying to push him off of her, he wouldn't stop. Thankfully, one of her friends came and rescued her, and she said that she just thought it was because he was drinking, but it did make her very uncomfortable and scared. Investigators had also found a laptop in this apartment that showed emails exchanges from Julissa and this Andy guy. The electronic trail had led them to Andy or Philip's username, which was sex addict. He was on different sexual websites, especially those with BDSM, and he was also interested in searching for transgender individuals. He would often talk to them, send pictures, but he would never meet up with them. As far as the ballistics testing, a gun that was found in his apartment was traced back to a purchase a few months prior to the murder where his fingerprints were on the documents. 
The duct tape used on Trisha also had fingerprints on it and these matched Philip. After being placed in jail awaiting trial, Philip was actually immediately put on suicide watch. It was said that security had found marks on his neck that appeared to have been made from his shoelaces, but he did survive. He was immediately seen by a psychiatrist who said that he didn't need to be taken to a mental hospital. During this time, the media also began to get letters from his fiance, Megan, that were saying things like, Philip is a beautiful man inside and out and did not commit this crime. Unfortunately, somebody else did and needs to be penalized. Philip was set up. Another said, a police officer in Boston or many is trying to make big bucks by selling this false story to TV stations. What else is new? Philip is an intelligent man who is just trying to live his life, so if you could leave us alone, we would greatly appreciate it. We expect to marry in August and share a wonderful, meaningful life together. Philip did plead not guilty. Two months later, Megan went to visit him and actually ended their engagement altogether, but she said that she still believed he was innocent. After this, Philip attempted to take his own life once again, and his trial was scheduled for July of 2010. For whatever reason, it was delayed until March 2011, and he once again tried to take his life on what would have been the day of his wedding to Megan. Then a year and a day after that, it was August 15th, 2010, before the trial even occurred and Philip was found dead in his cell. He had toilet paper in his throat, a plastic bag over his head with gauze. He also had a knife made from a pen and a piece of metal, which he had used to cut his arteries in his legs, his ankles, and his neck. He was completely covered in a blanket and his cell was covered in blood with Megan's name written all over. He'd also written their pet names to each other on the walls as well. Photos of them together were also scattered all about. But this meant that Julissa, Cynthia, and Trisha were never given the justice that they deserved. That's why I'm hoping to bring awareness to these cases today because they did not get a sentence out of him. They did not get to see what he would have been given. They did not get to know he was locked up for good because he took that away from them after he had traumatized them and taken Julissa's life. What do you think was his true motive here? Money, sex, although he didn't ever appear to have any sexual motive towards them, the thrill of it. Why did he take their underwear? Would he have continued if he wasn't caught? I do believe he would have. But I think that when it came to his fiance, he didn't want her to know anything about it. And maybe that's why he tried to take his life. Do you think it was guilt? Do you think it was just because of the relationship with his fiance that wasn't working out? What do you think? This is a case that I feel like has a lot of questions to it. And we have the answers in some ways. And I'm so happy there are survivors to tell their stories. But in so many ways, there is just information that doesn't make sense. So if you have any ideas or theories, please leave them down below. And don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.